You are now listening to the Minority Trailblazer Podcast. Let the story begin. One time for the lovers, two times for the ladies, three times for the brothers, four times for the babies. Do you love her? 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 One time for the lovers, two times for the ladies, three times for the brothers, four times for the babies. Do you love her? 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 Brown skin, love a brown skin, love a brown. Brown skin, love a brown skin, love a brown. She my brown skin, love a brown skin, love a brown. She my brown skin, love a brown skin. Hold me down. Damn. Welcome to the Minority Trailblazer Podcast, and I'm your host Greg Eel, the Culture Change Agent. You already know on this show we interview young successful minorities in a variety of fields to educate, empower, and inspire our current and future generation leaders. And I guarantee, side note, side note, side note, you're going to hear that one more time because today we're debuting the first ever live podcast from New York. It wasn't our first live podcast, but I just wanted to kind of make this a special episode. And I haven't released any of the live podcasts that we've done over the last like seven times we did the live event, so I wanted to give y'all some rare audio in its entirety from New York when I interview Abu Fofana. He's a crazy, crazy dope individual. I had an opportunity to meet up. I was in New York last weekend, and no, last week, rather, for a meetup. Man, dog, like, dude just adds value. Shout out to everybody that came to the New York meetup, man. It was a great, great, great time. There was a mix-up. First, we went to the public hotel, and then we had to kind of redirect, and then we ended up going to this dive bar, man. It was a phenomenal time, and I look forward to going forward when I go into cities, man, doing different meetups. We just talk, talk, build, grow together, man. So thank you. Shout out to Shania. Shout out to Fatima. Shout out to uh, Crystal Bridges, Tip- Tiffany Robinson. Who else? Justin Gaither. Oh, my brother, Justin Schaefer. And so many more that came out and showed love, man. We had tacos, expensive tacos. Matter of fact, I didn't have tacos. They had tacos. Too expensive for me. <laughs> and then we uh, we had some. We had a good time at the bar. Also, also, we had Ariel Lopez from 2020 Shift that is on this live taping, man, she dropped gem after gem. And matter of fact, many of y'all know because I had her on a previous podcast. So, man, this is this this episode is uh, it's cool. You get the live interaction, you get to see us in rare form. So, I just want to debut this on a Monday. It's going up on a Monday. That was corny. I ain't gonna do that. But yeah, on a Monday, on a Monday, on a Monday. And for all of you, for all you that have been sending me emails, tweeting, yo, gee, you getting Hollywood on us, man. You getting these Harvard gigs, and now you can't be consistent with the podcast. What's going on? Yo, chill. Chill. We've been creating content. I've been in the lab, been working in the dark, and I guarantee, 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 I got a lot of stuff on the pipeline, so I apologize for missing two weeks, but we back with events. We back on this Thursday, and yo, we got a live event, so let me do some housekeeping, and then I'm going to get right to the audio. Housekeeping, housekeeping, housekeeping. Yo, November 4th, we will be in Oakland, California, or San Francisco, Oakland, California area for a live podcast, so you can find information about that at greggyhill.com. Backslash MTP Live. We got some great guests. I can't wait to share who we got to have interviewing. And man, it's going to be a freaking dope event. Also, 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 November 11th, we're going to be in Dallas, Texas for another version of Live Podcast. Guests and location coming soon. You can also find that at greggio.com. Backslash MTP Live. And November 18th, we're going to be in North Carolina a State University in Greensboro. So all the information you can find at the link I just mentioned, as well as December 2nd. In Seattle, Washington. And if you are located in Raleigh, you want to hear me live Friday, October 20th, 2017 at 6.30 p.m. I will be speaking at the Raleigh Convention Center, room 402 for Southeast Raleigh Innovation Challenge. They're giving away $120,000 to finalists that are pitching their company ideas. And what's dope about it is it's specifically for minority underrepresented people's businesses. So it's going to be huge, 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 huge. And it's a final pitch competition. So you don't, you can't really uh, sign up the pitch there, but companies and individuals will be pitching. It's going to be a dope event. They gave me 20 minutes on the mic and it's going to be phenomenal. And it is free. You can get more information at bit.ly backslash G H Riley. Once again, it's bit.ly backslash G H Riley. Tickets are free and it's presented by the United Way of Greater Triangle, the city of Raleigh, 
Wake County government, and the Carolina Small Business Development Fund and Innovation and Entrepreneurship Center. So make sure if you won't got your minority troll blazer gear, what? It's about to, it's the fall. It's about to be winter. So I need you in that black, that navy, that white, that gray. I don't know. I need you in that gear. So make sure you go cop it at minoritytrailblazer.com as well. This is my last housekeeping tip. The conference is on the way. I am pumped up. I am excited. And March 9th and 10th, we're going to take this thing to a whole nother level. Like I got eight more speakers locked in. I'm going to be doing an announcement in a couple of days. And side note, I'm doing something special just for my Minority Trailblazer podcast listeners. I've been talking about this conference for the last couple of years. It's finally coming into fruition March 9th and 10th, 2018. I just locked down the first eight speakers. When I tell you it's going to be a game changer, it's going to be a game changer. And the secret is for the next four days, October 9th through October 12th, get $100 off. Yep, for the first 10 people that register, get $100 off. What is the promo code? Minority Trailblazer G. Minority Trailblazer G. Where do you register? MTBConf.com. Once again, that's MTBConf.com to register. Jump into this podcast. Let me stop. Let me stop. Let me stop. Let me stop. Before I jump into the podcast, I want to say one thing. Boston was phenomenal. Harvard was phenomenal. I learned so much. I learned so much. And I'm going to talk to you more about it on Thursday when I introduce the next podcast. But thank y'all for your prayers. Thank y'all for your support. It means the world. I mean, to go on Harvard's campus and do two presentations. Game changer presentations, man. To see. And y'all know where I was at two years ago. Y'all remember listening to podcasts. I was nowhere near that. And to not only be there, but to add value and dominate. Because the difference is showing up. Showing up and adding value and dominating. So I hopefully open up a lot of doors for other people. And I got the chance to bring my boy Daryl Bellamy out, man. He delivered a good word. Shout out to Dr. Steven Isop. Shout out to Monica Kwa. Shout out to Alexis Caban, Dr. Christine Ortiz. Who else? Who else? Who else? Oh, Isaiah Yudatong. Man, so many people made that show, that stuff happen. Harvard, Harvard Innovation Lab, Scott, shout out to Scott, Joanna, all here, and everybody else in Boston, man, for showing mad love. Oh, oh, mama, shout out to oh, mama as well, man. So thank y'all, thank y'all so much for the support and love. And I can't wait to see y'all in Dallas, in Oakland, in Seattle, in Greensboro, hopefully in Raleigh in a couple weeks, man. So I'm going to shut up. I'm going to stop talking. And here is the live audio from New York City. All right, real quick, real quick. Um, we are finally, finally about to begin. So I'm freaking excited about that. Uh, and I thank y'all for bearing with me. Luckily, my loyal listeners of the podcast already know that I'm a guy that I execute. It ain't always going to be like perfect, but we're going to get it done. So <laughs> like, I, this is the guy to do two and a half hour podcast. So of course, he would be running late. And it's crazy. Like the grind personified. Abu had to run like eight blocks. Like I saw her running and stuff like that. He's like, yo, because you got off on, what'd you get? He got off on 9th Street, but if you're not, like, from New York, you get off at 9th Street, you think you're there, and it could be, like, a mile away. So, um, <laughs> so as customary, before we begin, because um, I've been filling in, like, text messages and emails all day about uh, freaking, where do, where do you find this place? Like, it's like a mile. It's like a secret garden. It's like a forest. <laughs> like, like, I feel like you need, like, a secret password just to kind of, like, get into the spot. So, um, as always, as always, I try, before I even introduce a guest, or start the show or anything, um, I just try to just talk kind of where I was at. Like, so two years ago, it's crazy. It's crazy how God works, crazy how life works. So two years ago, um, I was in New York. I was staying at my line brother's house. And that was, uh, after I had uh, left corporate America. So if anybody has just followed my journey and whatnot, last four years, I've been six months in corporate America, six months entrepreneurship, broke and realizing like, yo, I got to go back. And I get, I kept doing that for, for four years, for four years because I didn't really know the process or the strategy or really how to make money. I could bring people out. I could promote events, do all this stuff, but it's different really operating a business. And I was a hustler. So I was at a point, man, I was just dead broke. And my homegirl, Jasmine, that's why I love, um, everybody on the tour that's meant something to me. Jasmine, we kicked off the tour. She gave me like a hundred dollars. I had no money, a hundred dollars to get a ticket to New York. And my plan was to come to New York. After all I really already did was to like file like a job, like waiting at tables and just, just start something new. Cause in Durham, I thought it was, everything was a, a wrap for me. I mean, I was here for like two weeks straight. I had like $30. I used that $30 for the, for the Metro pass. And I was in Brooklyn library 
sitting here like just trying to looking up jobs, applying. And then you, I was going to all these dead end interviews because New York, you put something out there, they hit you right back. I'm going to this junk suit and tie. They trying to have like making copies for like ten dollars an hour. I was like, what in the world? So, uh, uh, and I didn't want to tell my roommate because even though it's my line brother, I was still like, I didn't want to tell him I was that broke. So I got, I, I, I took ten dollars of that. And got pancakes, white so pancakes for the whole 10 days, right? So, cause I mean, pancakes, you can make that thing stretch. I don't know if y'all, I don't know where y'all from, but you can make pancakes stretch. So I was stretching pancakes, eating pancakes every day. He's like, yo, where the syrup at? So, <laughs> like, what, what is it doing, Greg, doing? So, uh, that's why I had to come back and now just be in this, uh, a different situation. But all that stuff wasn't negative. Because guess what? I know now we're, we're riding a wave and we're starting to really, um, gain some traction on a lot of things is I, I, I just feel like I'm just cut from a, from a different cloth. Cause I, I take all these ex- learned experiences since 13 hustling sodas, um, in high school, making a hundred dollars a day and all this other stuff. I take all those learned experiences and apply them now. So, I mean, if anybody listens to the podcast, that's the whole culture of it all. We ain't the best, most technical show or anything. We are the show that. If you've been through stuff, you use that and apply it wherever you're at, and you just ha- it's just a different mentality. So I hate when people say, "Okay, I want to be I want to become a professional speaker. I want to become a writer." No, you already are that. You're just it's just a mindset thing. So um, and this, this tour took me to some crazy places. Like Charlotte was phenomenal. Then it was DC. DC came to DC. Dude pulled up on me in a Maserati. He was like, "Yo, I've been following you for a couple of years." I was like, "Who is this?" So I was like, "Me?" I was like, "Cause first I was like, I was like, yo, is he really coming to my event?" And uh. Time, it, it turns out he uh, he was a fantasy football champion at ESPN. He won like $3 million from fantasy football. So he immediately came, shared his story and whatnot. I was like, yo, you meet some random people, right? So, and then Houston had flying roaches and stuff like that. Like, it was crazy. I'm on a third story thing. And I saw this thing. I was like, I was going to mess up his day. I was feeling good Saturday. I saw this roach. I said, boop. He said, Poof. I was like, yo, no, he did not. So I was like tripping. But Houston was crazy love. Uh, Atlanta, like, we had all these black women with, like, none of them, none of them had natural hair. They, like, they regulated the process hair and they came out in the rain. Like, it was raining. I, I saw them, like, I almost cried. It's like, seriously, <laughs> y'all don't understand. It was like a tsunami. And I was like, all these black women not gonna show up. But they showed up. Like, I don't know how they did. They put all this stuff on their head. They came through. So that was huge. And then freaking last night in New York, I left my, uh, my debit card in, like, Harlem Tavern. So I spent, all day last last uh, last night, I ran like four miles with a book bag, all the, all across New York, um, yeah, to get my wallet back. So, but it's all good. This is the kind of stuff I do. So, it is, that's just life I live. Um, but I'm excited today, most importantly, because New York and the people that come and the people that are here right now are in so many different spaces and career spaces, so many different journeys, so many, so many different like. Um, Spaces in general in life. So it's always great to see when you come to these events and you bring in like-minded people together, but it's just a totally different and to kind of hear these perspectives. And that's why I said on this tour mode, uh, when I, in Charlotte, I had the model where a live podcast and then we had the four corners of networking, but I said, yo, I know so many people in these cities. I need to kind of open up and share more stories. So now we added on, um, the PSA segment. But, um, today in this audience, man, we have a couple people that are going to be interviewing today. I'm not going to steal their thunder, so I'm allow them to kind of share kind of who they are and what they do. But I mean, I'll start with Ariel, man. I mean, I've been following her. Well, it's crazy how attention works because I was like, "Yo," I, I kept seeing it on Twitter, and it was like because I think Chastity Cooper retweeted something, and like Melissa Kimball, like the Black Creative Society, they retweeted something. I was like, "I need, I need to be, I need to be around." And then right when I thought about that, she had sent me an email. It was like, "Yo, can I get on the sh- like? Can we can we partner and get on the show and to have her here and kind of share her journey?" Um, from respect, she's killing it, but she's doing it in a way that is not, um, how do I say it? How do I say it? In a way where it's, it's making like business sense. Cause I know a lot of people out there, they start nonprofits. A lot of people out there start so many different ventures. And unfortunately, sometimes they don't have the savvy to really make it sustainable, make it kind of profitable and really like leverage it. That's why I'm glad I also have Sherelle in the crowd that she does some phenomenal work in Charlotte, just moved to New York and Columbia. And I think they have just kind of, not to say they've mastered it yet, but they're mastering the art of, okay, this is my idea, but here, hey, how can I get it funded? Let's be real. When black businesses, a lot of us sometimes, we can, we can have the most creative ideas and all this stuff, but to get funding, to get sponsorships, to get other people to buy in and believe in us, sometimes it's kind of difficult, specifically when you're not open to, like, other people to kind of give advice. That's why I'm glad to have Ms. Bridges in here, too. Um, I don't know. How do we, how do we connect? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. We connected on LinkedIn. <laughs> Yeah, she just wanted a book on LinkedIn, so I sent her the book. 
and we had communication. And you're coming from Florida? Yeah, yeah coming from Florida. And that's the most pressing thing about this whole thing. Like in Atlanta, I had people from uh, freaking Florida, some from Tennessee come out. And it's all started with an idea. Like a month, a month before I started the tour, I was like, yo, I, I want to do something to kind of ex- expand, like to stretch myself. Because in the, the day, sometimes we can get to these comfort zones and, and, and it's like, yo, I want to do it. And plus, I'm looking at the market too. Podcast market is getting very crowded. Every, and I love black females, but they're killing everything. Like, there's like seven to 10. We're doing the same thing. So I said, okay, I got to hurry up and innovate before they can be like, yo, I'm not on them. I know the trailblazers. We on this, we on that. So I said, okay, first, I knew I had the conference coming in March. So I said, how can I build momentum? And then also, how can I touch different cities? And we, we came up with this format. And then I, I met Abu through Monica Kwok. Monica Kwok. Um, has a very interesting story herself. And she said, you know, you gotta, you gotta talk to Abu. I was like, yo, side note, like 25% of my uh, podcast guests are of African descent. Like it's crazy how it works out. So, um, and Abu is just like, I'm gonna let him tell his story. Cause I hate as a speaker, especially when I was a novice first starting, then the presenters would read my whole thing. And then all I had was my story starting off. So if you already said the fact that I've been homeless, you already said the fact that I wrote a book, you already said the fact that I did all this, I'm sitting up here like, yo, what, what do I talk about? I had nothing else to talk about. So I'm not going to share that, uh, spread that thunder. And, um, yo, we're going to, this is how it's going to form, format. We're going to have the live podcast. Immediately after that, we're going to have three people, um, come to the stage and kind of share their story, but in the lens of one topic. So I think it's going to be neat. And then we're going to have the four corners of networking. So the people that, um, that I'm interviewing, as well as uh, myself and someone else are going to be in these corners, kind of just everybody can kind of build, see what everybody else is doing, see if there's any synergy, um, as well as if you have any app practical um, questions that you see from what they've shown, that you can ask them there. So we're probably not going to have an open-ended question and answer model because they'll be in a corner. Um, so y'all can write down notes while you're there of questions and whatnot. Um, just like with the, with the podcast, it's going to be half like story-driven, but real half really practical. Really nuggets because in the, the day, stories are cool, but stories don't pay bills. Stories don't run businesses. Stories can't when you when you leave here be like, okay, what can I implement next? So I'm gonna be really heavy on that. Um, so without further ado, I guess I got to do it for the camera, um, the the intro for the, and then I'm gonna go ahead and do it. So, um, dang, I don't want to be looking right here and doing like that. We can catch it from the side. So, welcome to the Minority Troubles podcast. I'm your host, Greg E Hill D. Coach a change agent. On this show, we interview young, successful minorities in a variety of fields to educate, empower, and inspire our current and future generation of leaders. And as always, I say it, we have a phenomenal show. Dope people, dope concepts, dope energy, um, dope spot that a lot of people can't find. But, yo, I love it that way. Like, so if you knew, I knew you were a real listener, a real supporter, if y'all came and found this spot because it's a mile just to get here. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce, I want to introduce my introduce, Ariel Lopez, and I'm glad I know how to say his last name, Abu Fofana, to the My Note of Trouble as a podcast. Clap it up. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Greg. Uh, so, as customary, uh, we're going to jump right. Uh, we're going to have, I'm going to ask a question, and we're going to jump right into, because we don't have the long time to build it. Like, uh, you, if people know the podcast, a slow, slow build, but we got to jump right into it as is the time. So I want, Eric, you can start off, kind of show, tell our audience kind of like who you are um, and your, a backstory before we get into like what you, what you do. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today, Greg. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Ariel Lopez, and I'm the founder and CEO of 2020 Shift. We train people on the skills that they need to find careers that they love in digital media and technology. And then we also work with a ton of different companies like Spotify, Snapchat, Uber, Oscar, and more um, to help them develop pipelines of talent. My personal background is in talent acquisition as well as recruiting. So I've been working in technology for years um, alongside different hiring managers and recruiters at a ton of different startups and major brands, which is how I got the idea for 2020 Shift in the first place. Um, and outside of that, I'm also a career coach and a public speaker. Um, so I really love doing stuff like this. This is my way of kind of sharing my gems with everyone. Um, and in terms of my background story, so uh, the reason Greg and I initially connected is because I'm from North Carolina. Um, I grew up in Greenville. <laughs> Greenville. Um, <laughs> Greenville, only true North Carolinians. Yeah. North Carolina, unless you know somebody that went to East Carolina University, which is where I went to school. Um, and yeah, I was actually speaking to someone about 
um, my story a little bit before this started. Um, so I actually dropped out of college. I have, I, I guess somewhat cliche, but not really cliche, tech founder story where I was just like, I have this idea and I'm just going to go after it. Um, dropped out, moved to New York, started my career in recruiting. Um, throughout that time, I just started to realize the disparity in the space when it comes to women and minorities. Um, and it was just very purpose-driven for me to try um, to kind of break down that barrier for as many people as possible and really just teach them about um, what they can actually do in technology. Um, there's a big misconception that you have to be an engineer or a developer to work in tech, and that's just not true. Um, so we actually train people on everything from product management to user experience design, digital marketing, data analytics. These are all fast-growing fast, grow, fast growing, um, fields within the space that no one's really talking about but are actually ideal positions for us because these are do, things that we do naturally well anyway. Um, and then I also work with companies to really just kind of help them think about how are we hiring people, how are we retaining them, and how are we thinking about the future of work. Okay, wow. That's, that's a lot. That's great. That's great. <laughs> uh, and now, Boo, take us away, bro. Uh, hey, how you guys doing? My name is Obu Fofana. Besides long walks on the beach, I like running six blocks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, I'm the founder of House of Fofana. Uh, very creative when it comes to business names. Uh, use my last name. And I'm also the founder of Master Year One and also the VP of Base Butter. So um, I'm doing a lot, most of my friends would say. Uh, and the way I got to where I am today is, I started my first business when I was 18 years old. I was a freshman in college over at Penn State University. I was running a clothing business. And you know, it was, it was a struggle. Um, no one really wanted to invest in clothing business. <laughs> such a saturated market. And you tell them you're making t-shirts, well, everyone's making t-shirts, right? <laughs> And um, I ended up partnering with the Special Olympics, and for every shirt we would sell, we would donate to the Special Olympics. And so I remember it was, it was very challenging selling clothes. And uh, there was an opportunity where John Legend came to my campus. I stalked him a little bit, that's besides the point. <laughs> I got John Legend to sponsor my company, and then the second person I got was Damon John. So I went from selling six shirts a week to 600 a day, generating about 20 to 30K revenue when I turned 19 years old. I had 16 employees. I was running this whole operation out of my dorm room, taking about 30 to 35 credits a semester. So I ended up graduating school in two and a half years. I sold that clothing business. And then I was like, you know what? I think I want to do high-end fashion. I packed my bags up and I moved to Italy. <laughs> and I started working for the Versace family and taking fashion design classes because I thought I wanted to be this high-end fashion designer. And all my courses was in, in Italian. So I didn't know how to speak Italian, <laughs> anything. And it was difficult. I would show the professor my sketch, and like, good, bad. And it, <laughs> and like, yeah, it was great feedback, great feedback. And I ended up leaving there, and I came back to the States, and I started doing work over at the White House. I know none of this makes sense, but uh, there's, there's, a, there's a common thread in here. And um, after working at the White House, I returned and I started working back at PwC, Price Warehouse Coopers, and I would focus on tech consulting, doing a lot of CRM, customer relation management tools. Um, then I was like, you know what, this is great, but it's kind of not me. So I ended up leaving and I started my second business, which I'm currently running, which is House of Obama. It's a consulting business focused on tech strategy and operations. And what we focus on is kind of two tiers. The first is Fortune 100 and 500 companies around implementation and technology. The second tier, because it's a passion of mine, is minority businesses. So I teach minority businesses how to build a brand around profit rather than passion. Mm. So many times I'll run into someone and you know it's their, it's their passion. They're passionate about it. But I'm like, wait, like, are you making any money? They're like, well, in two years, three. I'm like, no, no. Like, let's start and be profitable day one. And so I started doing that, and I have about like 15 to 18 different clients. And I uh, became the VP of Base Butter. I don't know if uh, you, do any guys know what Base Butter is. Yeah, well, you know Chanel. Yeah. So uh, Base Butter is um, a skincare brand focused on creating products for women of color. And um, I didn't know anything about the industry, but I knew business, and I believed in the founder Chanel. And I didn't know women had so much difficulties, especially women of color, when it when it came to selecting the right products for your skin. There was nothing tailored to you. 
And um, so Tudor Shamil told me that, I was like, you know what, I'm on board. And so I'm in the midst of a, a lot of different things. So I'm pretty, you know, efficient in terms of managing my time. Uh, and, uh, that's who I am. And um, yeah. Wow, that's great, man. Clap it up for that. Jeez. Um, and I'm actually going to do New York a little different, like, and hopefully y'all don't leave me hanging. After I ask my questions, I am going to leave some time while we're all together to y'all to ask questions. Um, I, I don't do that in every city because some cities I threw the alley-oop and everybody was like, no questions. So I just made it. But I think y'all, y'all taking notes, y'all look real inquisitive. So I definitely open that. But I, I'm at, I'm immediately, because y'all, y'all mentioned some, some very high level stuff, some high level brands y'all work with, some high level wins. So in every the podcast I bring on people in the store, just blow me away. I'm like, dang, why am I even in the building? I always try to kind of like humanize and then show the flesh for it. So I'm going to, the, the first question I want to ask y'all is, uh, um, based on like, Thus far on your journey, what has been the biggest success, like the biggest moment, but also are you in lead with what has been your like biggest uh, struggle? Like what's the biggest, I, wouldn't, I don't want to call it failure because I always get rebuked. I don't use failure, but they're like, oh, failure. They're like, I don't use the failure. So save, please don't give me that spill. Like, <laughs> but what has been your biggest like, dang, I messed up. I don't know what's going on moment. And then through your journey, what's been your biggest highlight? I love your three-part question. Yeah, everybody knows me. I always I I like ask five questions in one. Which one do I go to first? Um, I would say biggest win thus far this year has definitely been Snapchat. Um, So I just want to shout out to Janelle. That's my co-founder. She just came in. Hey, girl. Um, I just want to speak to the power of women in business together. And I think so often, like. I have a lot of black female friends that are either solo founders or they have like a side hustle and that's basically it. Rarely do I come across two women that have come together to try to make something happen. And Janelle has been there since day one. Like that is my rock. Like I would not be able to go after all of these crazy ambitious things without her. Um, so I just want to do a shout out to her really quickly. Um, but all that to say, Janelle was there when I first went after Snapchat. So coming from the career coach side, Um, I always try to train people on how to be really aggressive and do things that probably don't make sense, but you should do them anyway. Um, So I was on LinkedIn, and I came across um, a guy by the name of Jarvis Sam, and he is oversees diversity at Snapchat. Um, And one of the things that LinkedIn doesn't tell you is that people kind of make their contact information really readily available. You just have to know where to look for it. Um, So I checked his contact info. It had his email but it also had his phone number. And I remember telling Janelle, I was like, you know what? If I was crazy, I would just text him and be like, hey, <laughs> you should probably get your number off of LinkedIn. Um, but I did not do that. Instead, I sent him an email, but I, um, I use a lot of humor when I do my outreach, and I think that also works for me personally. Um, but I was like, hey, I came across your, your profile. We should definitely talk, because at that point, you know, we've been working with really big brands for a while, right? So although Snapchat is a big brand, at that point, we had landed Spotify, we had landed Uber, um, we were just starting to kick off stuff with Google. So it's just like, you are the new shiny object, but don't try to play me. Because we still have <laughs> clients that are just as big as you, right? Um, so I was like, we're doing really dope work with a lot of cool brands. Like, we should have a conversation. And that conversation turned into seven months of me chasing Snapchat. Um, if you guys remember, earlier on this year, they IPO'd. So that definitely did not work in my favor. Um, <laughs> advice to anyone that's working or plans on working with tech companies, it's pretty unpredictable because people go through stuff at any other time. Right? I also mentioned Uber is one of our clients. Right? So uh. for six months straight, starting in January, it was like, ah! you know, it kind of became like an extension of their PR and communication. I had people reaching out to me. I'm like, I don't know what Travis Kalanick is doing, <laughs> but that's just him. Please don't kill me. Okay? Um, don't at me. But that, that, I mentioned that story to mention persistence. The only reason I stand here today is because I am relentless, right? Like you have to have it in you, that intrinsic kind of motivation to where it's just like, I'm not gonna stop until I get what I want. And I remember having that conversation with Janelle, like he came to New York, because they're based in Venice, we were supposed to meet for coffee. I was literally walking into the bakery, he sent me a text, he was like, I can't make it. I was like, you are really trying me right now. But I remember the vow I remember the vow that I made to myself and to our team last year. I was like, I'm not gonna stop until Snapchat is a client. Like I'm just gonna keep going. 
Um, so that conversation turned into other conversations. He mentioned that they're really hiring for sales. Anyone that's interested in sales, please come to me because that's what we're helping them do is hire diverse salespeople. Um, and I sent over like 10 profiles. I was like, these are people we have in our network right now. Let's talk. He got back to me. He was yeah. like, this is perfect. From there, it turned into a close, right? So seven months, like I could have at any point, three months in, I'm done with that. They really trying it right now. When he canceled coffee the morning of, and I was literally standing in the bank, I could have been like, I am seriously over this. And I'm just not going to go through this, through with this anymore. But I didn't stop, right? And I think as an entrepreneur, um, or just anyone in your career, you have to have that kind of drive to where it's like, your purpose and your goal is so clear, you don't see anything else. All the bullshit, can I curse? Go ahead. All right, all the bullshit that comes <laughs> up along the way, like you're gonna go through a lot of shit, right? Things aren't gonna make sense. Things you think you should be a part of, like damn, I can't believe you didn't get chosen for that list. I can't believe like they didn't wanna include me on that, right? Like you're gonna go through a lot of rejection. You're gonna hear no a lot. But you have to be so focused on getting to the yes that you don't stop until you get there. And because I have that sense of hustle, that's why we've been able to work with so many clients and really just scale the business. I'm going to leave it there because I know there was like two other parts to that yeah. question. Oh, but, do, but I do. I don't I do because no, I I boo strategic. I boo going he going he going he like whatever you say he going he going hit it there. But I do want to speak. The, the 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 main question was what has been the most challenging moment through it all. Um, I think the most challenging moment, and we're still going through this right yeah. now, is raising money. Right. So um, I quit my job. I worked at a really large boot camp called General Assembly um, for about a year and a half, two years before I decided to quit to do this full time. Um, so I really got a chance to see education and how it works in tech. And, you know, I learned what they were doing wrong. I was like, well, I'll make sure we don't do that. Um, and, you know, that paired with recruiting and just all of my coaching experience, that really kind of, like, shaped the business. But I knew, like, right, like, I don't come from, there was never a silver spoon. I didn't go to an Ivy League school, right? I dropped out of East Carolina University, <laughs> which is not, like, a selling moment for me, right? <laughs> So I've always had to like think about, all right, how do we be strategic about this? Um, so I told myself I can't quit and still pay rent in New York <laughs> and live if we don't have money coming in. Um, so we, at that point, we had been in conversations with who was a former investor, um, but essentially the deal that we cut at the time was we gave him equity in exchange for our salaries, all of our startup costs, all of our expenses. And that wasn't just me, like talking about the team. I was like, it's not, Janelle needs to be taken care of, right? It's not just me. If we are a package deal, right? Um, so I was really thinking about how are we going to be able to make moves and just live while we try to scale the business. Um, and right now we're preparing to raise our seed round. And I'm happy to talk to anyone about what VC funding looks like, but it's a very scary place, um, especially if you're black. Especially if you are a woman, especially right now, right? You look at 500 startups and, you know, all the guys that are getting called out on the sexual harassment. Like, these are things that we deal with every single day, right? It's like waking up in the morning and knowing. It's kind of like playing the lottery. Like, I have, like, one in a million chance of actually raising over a million dollars. But I'm going to go after this shit anyway, right? So I think for me, I've always been able to take you know, my struggles or my lemons and I just turn it into lemonade because that's the only way I know how to live and that's what I've been doing for so long. All right, thank you. Thank you for all that. Thank you for all that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, I the, the biggest success, biggest failure. My bad. Yeah, I think the biggest wins for me is always finding myself in situations where I never would imagine. Like, who would have thought, you know, I was born in Sierra Leone, West Africa, right? I uh, get a full scholarship, academic and athletic, the university, and then I'm in the living room at a Versace house, right? Sitting next to Allegra Versace and Miami. Like, I would have never found myself in that situation. Or going to D.C. and finding myself in a situation where I'm around government like officials, right? Like, I would have never thought, like, that would have been me. And having that opportunity requires you to, instead of goal set, fear set, right? Change your mentality. And instead of, you know, always trying to, because the things with goal setting is you're always aiming for things you know you can do. 
right? Fear setting is you're challenging yourself to do something that you may be uncomfortable with. And so I started developing this mindset when I was like 18, 19. You know, I went from the guy that, you know, do anything to be in a room, to, you know, drive, like wash the, uh, erase boards or sweep the floor just to hear the conversations. And then, you know, being a person that'd be sitting at the table and then all of a sudden being like at the head of the table. So it's really funny how like those transitions work, but really fear setting, I think, are some of my biggest wins finding myself in situations. Now, in terms of challenges um, and struggles, I would go with uh, my environment, right? Because a lot of times um, I go out to Italy, I come back, you know, where my mom lives out in the Philadelphia area and your friends that you grew up with are right there. And a lot of times they could, they could limit you in terms of, you know, what your potential is and what you know your potential is. A lot of times they're like, well, you can't do that. And I remember for so long, you know, I'd read these magazines and see like this young kid on the cover doing such like great things. And I would, you know, I would always say, I want to do that. And they're like, well, that's one in a million. And then I finally changed my mindset and was like, you know what, I'm that one. You guys could think you're that million, but I believe I'm that one. So my environment, and I know a lot of people, especially minorities, where you don't have access to information. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up and I moved around a lot. I used to live in India. I lived in Paris, London, and uh, Milan. But growing up in Philly, I remember I did like first through sixth grade in this um, white neighborhood. So, you know, one of, right, one of the only black person in the, the classes and things like that. And I remember being around my friends, their parents, you know, they successful, you know, Wall Street, whatever, running businesses. So they would teach their kids, like, about money, right? Where I grew up, we didn't talk about money, right? Money was the last thing we talked about. <laughs> it was never brought up, so I never had access to that information. And now that I do, I always make sure that, you know, another thing that I noticed being in the entrepreneur world, no matter where you are in the world, for some reason, and I've been trying to test this theory, but... African Americans are the most um, to themselves when it comes with information, mm. yeah. right? They don't yeah. like sharing or they yeah. don't understand that yeah. it's better to build together. You go further together than trying to do it alone. Whatever your vision is, if there's something that you can align with with someone else, why not try it, right? Two brains are better than one. So again, you know, my biggest losses, I would say, was my environment because You'll put your, the car on park and you'll just wait there, right? One year will go by, two years will go by, three years will go by. And then when you finally start and you're, you, know, you hit the ground running, you just wasted three years when you know, you know you could have done it. Maybe no one else did, but you know within yourself that you could have done it all along. But you just wasted three years on park because of what everyone else told you, right? What your environment uh, screwed up. So, um, nah. Nah, that's huge, man. That's huge. That's huge. That's huge. Clap it up for that. Clap it up for that. Um, um, and the next piece I want to go to as far as I'm, I want to stay in that information lane. I want to get real practical with it. But before we do, I would be remiss um, not to shout out uh, my brother Messiah Davis out there, man. It's crazy. It's a fun, true story because many of y'all seen me. Majority of the connections I've got have been really linked in. Like I had a post that went viral, 88,000 likes, 4,000 comments like a year ago. And I already had like 20, 21 episodes on the podcast, so people came through that. And now I leverage LinkedIn as a really uh, a powerful platform. I get a couple thousand a month just off LinkedIn, just being strategic on that. But the whole story, like when I was homeless, when I was sleeping on couches, like Messiah, he allowed me and for a whole year to sleep on his couch. Man, he never asked no questions. He never like, what's going on? I was just going through it at A&T. That's how it took me that long to graduate. Never asked me no questions, never like pressed on me and... On the whole, never out of me to the friends like, yo, this, yo, remember G Hill that was facing the campus, yo? He like on the couch and mind you, like seriously, he could have easily been like that. He could have been like, yo, so, and, and let's be, let's be real. I did, I pledged fraternity my sophomore year, Alpha Alpha. And during that time, I wasn't around like my freshman, like me, we were in separate freshman year. Messiah, Ken, Eric, all them. When I pledged, I was around a frat, but that's how I started joining me in entertainment too. So I hosted parties and whatnot. So I wasn't around them like that. As much as I used to. So he could easy me like, yo, Greg, he left us there, whatever. But he always knew that since, since he ever met me, I always like, I'm going to be a legend. I'm going to do this. Even when it didn't come true at, and when I wanted it to. So I, I hope he always believed me. So when I came back in the fold, I had no place to stay. We, we ain't talk, we ain't talk all the time, 
but he still let me in. So I definitely, I'll be remiss because during this whole tour and as I grow and just as in general, I always try to always own where I'm at regardless. So everybody that around us, they do know if, that, that have been homeless, that have been in and out of, of different situations, they know, yo, it's, it's real tangible, tangible, fast. Stuff can change real, real fast. So um, is, if you own that, it builds your credibility with regular people. That's how you build connection with influencers in my end. Not saying, okay, I'm just on your level. No. If you're not like, hey, I don't have no money right now. How do I get money? How can we make this happen? Instead of like putting around. But let's get back to the information piece. So Hmm. We can attack it. I guess the best way is but to, to get real practical. Knowing what you know now, what would you have told yourself as far as like building it strategically now and partnering with brands? What would you tell yourself now? If you had a room, right? And you're, you're five years ago, you're right there. You could just give it a cheat sheet and still have the same lesson you learned through the grind. What would you say? Both of y'all. Validate your product first. If I could go back. Oh my God. So much wasted time. Um, what most people do is like they come up with an idea, whatever their idea may be, and it's just like I want to do this because I think it's cool and I think people are going to like it. That doesn't mean anyone is going to give a shit about anything that you're building. And 99% of startups fail because people don't take the time to actually go and validate the product. Um, so what do I mean by that is basically saying, this is the goal or this is the mission or the vision for whatever I'm building. Let me go talk to people who will in theory be my customers and make sure that they actually want to buy this, right? Get an understanding of what their challenges are. Um, your job as an entrepreneur or as anyone is just to solve a problem, right? The best companies do intrinsically that, right? Like how do we solve a problem? How do we find a solution to something um, that people find challenging, right? Um, so, I mean, even if you had an original idea, you may be doing research and talk to people and get feedback and be like, scratch that, we're not gonna do that. Let's do this instead, because this is the thing that people say that they really, really want. Um, outside of validating the product, validating the pricing, right? Like not only from understanding your competitors in the marketplace, um, so if I wanted to start an e-commerce company and sell clothes, I'm probably going to research everyone from the fashion novas of the world to the tradesies to whoever um, and just figure out, okay, how are they packaging this? How are they pricing this? Sign up for your competitors' newsletters, right? A lot of people don't do that. Like, that is really good, valuable information Heck for yeah. you because you're going to see how people are moving, right? Like they send out an email every Monday morning and people like it. I'm going to do something similar. Or they send out an email, but they're lacking this one thing. And I feel like if I put that in there, that's going to be a differentiator for me. Right? So just being more strategic about what you're building instead of wasting time building it and then dealing with the challenges and becoming frustrated because people aren't reacting the way that you initially thought they would. Right? So for us, it's interesting because we have two sides to our market, right? So we have professionals that we actually train people, um, train people on those skills and we do events and, you know, other stuff that we charge people for. But then we also have the client side of the business, right? So what should Uber be paying us for the work that we're doing, right? And all those things look very, very different. Um, so if I could go back, you know, take it back to general assembly days, I would have spent a month just studying all that information um, before I, you know, hit the ground running. Um, something else I would say is just enjoy where you're at. I spent the last six months of my life at GA crying and being dramatic and throwing hissy fits because I just felt like I'm ready to be on my own. Do you know how many times this summer I've seen my friends go on vacation? And I'm like, damn, I did have some vacation time. I didn't even use, right? Like, if your company is giving you unlimited vacation, they're giving you food, travel, I don't care. They give you one free conference a year. Take advantage of it. Because once you make that leap and you get to the other side, you're going to wish that you would have taken advantage of that time. Like, GA, I could have taken classes. I could have learned how to play. Although our whole premise is you don't have to learn how to code, but I think it's something that would be valuable for a startup. <laughs> and I did it. I didn't take any classes. I went on a few vacations. I definitely could have OD'd on that if I wanted to, right? So don't always be thinking about where you should be. Mm. Like really start to appreciate where you are right now because ultimately you have to be positioned there for you to, mm. for you to get to where you're supposed to get at. And I feel like often that isn't said because we're always chasing, you know, perfection in our heads. 
And perfection doesn't look like what we're living right now, right? You get caught up in the circumstances like, damn, I thought I would have been making this. I thought I would have been engaged by now. Like, you got to let go of all that stuff, right? Because you'll just get frustrated. You won't live a happy life. And startup world, you know, especially in tech, this shit is crazy. Like, you never know what's going to happen on a day-to-day basis. You have to find that peace and that happiness. Because if you don't find it now, when you get on the other side, it's going to be really, really difficult for you to find that. And I feel like that's why a lot of entrepreneurs are just stressed out and they're unhappy. Um, so put that self-care first. Um, but I would also say strategically thinking, study the market, study your competitors, find a value prop, and really validate the product before you even go to market with it. Mm, great, great stuff, great stuff, great stuff. So we're talking about just the value of information? Yeah, value of information, or more specifically, knowing kind of what you know now over the last couple of years, cutting your teeth with Damon John, John Legend, those the T-shirt days to now working with consultant days, like, what would you tell yourself strategically? Like, okay, dude, if you did this, you'd probably be doing that. I think the, the biggest thing is that, you know, someone always told me done is better than perfect. Yeah. Right? And a lot of times we wait until something is perfect before we release it. And by that time, you know, that opportunity can pass, pass you by, right? And so just always remembering that no matter what your idea is, release a beta 1.0, you know, 2.0, 3.0. Some of the best companies, they allow their customers to fix their problem and tell them where to go to create better product, right, that they're serving them. So always remember, done is better than perfect. Another thing that I would tell myself is filter the things around you and the information that you receive and the people that you're following, right? If you're starting a business in a certain industry, like, you should be following people that, you know, you're going to be competing with, following people that inspire you rather than getting on your timeline and seeing so much negativity. Because that affects you. It really does affect you and your mood and what you want to do today. So filtering that and then also the people that are in your life. Because when you're about to start something, like I said, there's so much people that, you know, they're, like you can't be negative towards yourself because other people are already doing that for you. Right? So if you're negative towards yourself and other people are already doing that for you, you're, you've already lost before you started. You know, um, the third thing I would tell myself is like seek out a mentor Um, and a mentor and mentorship is very important because it gives you someone that has done something and built something. It may not be directly aligned with what you want to do. And if it is, that's perfect. If it's not, that's even better. Right. Because you got another view and perspective on your idea. But I know I wouldn't be where I'm at if uh, I didn't get in those rooms and nurture a relationship. Mentoring or seeking a mentor is not coming up to someone and saying, hey, can you be my mentor, right? It's about building a relationship. Like, you know, okay, this person likes, you know, they're in the beauty industry. So when you come across an article, you email them like, hey, I just found this very fascinating. I know you're in this industry and center. So you start building that relationship with the person. And eventually, they're going to ask you to be their mentor. They're like, oh, my God, like, let's grab dinner or let's grab lunch. Um, So I think... That mentoring closes the gap on your learning curve, what you need to learn. They bring you right up to speed to the information because they have a larger network than you do, right? So they're able to connect you with people. Uh, I remember my first investment. Uh, I was 19 years old. Uh, this restaurant, Galifi's, I, I, it was about 6.30 p.m. And uh, I walk into the, the bar area and, you know, at this point, we're, we're making money, but I needed more capital to be able to produce more products. So I walk in there, you know, uh, a, a Penn State t-shirt and everything, and I, and I walk in there, and the guy across the table is like, well, how much do you guys need? And at that time, again, I'm 19, I, I don't know what a lot of money is, I'm like $10,000. And he writes me a check, and he passes it across the table. And he said, well, now what are you going to use it for? I'm like, I, I don't know. I just, <laughs> I just thought 10000 was what I needed, you know? So they challenge you to think through why you actually need money. Because a lot of times we think we need 30000 to start up when all we really need is $3,000, right? And so he really challenged me, like, what are you going to use the money towards, right? And then what's going to be the return? What's the value? What are you prioritizing right now in your company? And so they really challenge you to come up to speed and um, play that game so you're not left behind with your competitors and things like that. So I think those are the three things 
um, I would have told myself. And I, I learned the hard way, but um, but now I have all that all that set up. Man, that's huge. And I think you hit on a, a couple of things. And um, one thing, two things I want to harp on is that as far as with the mentorship or just in general, reaching out to influence, whatever, I always say outside of like add, add value immediately. Like don't immediately go in for the ask. It's, it's a balance though, because sometimes yes. you need. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you need. Yeah, yeah, sometimes you just gotta shoot your shot. Like, but, but, but you can tell. <laughs> but sometimes you gotta add like add value. Like I hear all the time, like that. Everybody, hey, how'd you start speaking? I'm like, dude, I just I had three podcasts on that. I had a book about it. I got all this. So you you want to ask me how I started speaking and want to talk on the phone for an hour, and I just posted about it. A whole 40 minute podcast on everything. Okay, this is how you make money doing it. Okay, here's a press kit. I said, email me. I'll send you my press kit. I'll send you everything I got. But you want to be lazy. You like the post. You shared the post. You was like, yo, that boy Greg Hill on fire. So now, but. Link, like, to my, like, PayPal account. Yeah. But, but it's love now. I done got smart with it. I was like, let's think business wise. Now I got to pick my brain package. So I'll send you a book <laughs> and I'll give you a 30 minute call for $50. That's cheap. That cheap. So I said, yo, I'll do that. And then, but the thing is also, too, unfortunately, um, I think this is a bigger conversation to be had to kind of reframe, um, the people who are coaching, not everybody. I'm not going to paint the whole culture with a broad brush on our thoughts about value. Because sometimes you say $150 for an hour. They're like, man, I ain't, I ain't paying you $150 an hour. I'm a, but like, you can make 500 like, it, that 500 you make a couple thousand. Hour. Like yeah. imagine all the stuff. You work, you partner with major brands, right? I got a business. I want to partner with major brands. And you say, well, I got $400 and I'll I, I give you what you need for an hour. Yeah. They're going to be like, who she thinks she is? They're going to be tweeting. They're going to subtweet you. They're going to ask you. But they're like, yo, cats, cats think they all this and all that. But no. Sure. Sure. You know they will. But yo. It goes around like investment. Like investing. <laughs> like a lot of times that word investing in yourself is not a term that we're really familiar with. Like, right. why don't you invest in yourself? They're like, well, what do you mean? Wait, I got I to pay for this? Like, and we're also free? caught on like instant gratification, uh-huh. right? Yeah. Which my mama used to preach about. Shout out to her. <laughs> and I didn't appreciate during the time. You never appreciate it. Like, I'm like, well, damn, I just wanted the apple bottles tomorrow. I don't understand why it's that big of a deal. Um, the apple wow. bottles. Now We've come a long field. way. But, you know, like, <laughs> He's still, lost a lot enough. of us are still caught up in instant gratification, right? I just got paid, which means I'm about to go shop. That means it's lit this weekend. We're going to this day party. We're going to this brunch. We're in this like, you cannot do that and save and build. And I speak this because I'm practicing this in real life. Because I still like to turn up and do stuff too. But, you know, your friends ain't where you are and they ain't where you're trying to go. Right? Mm. So I talk about my friends that still go on vacation. That's because they still got salary. Yeah. I got to make sure a rat gets paid from me. Right, if I don't go out and hunt and kill, I don't eat. Right, like on like the <laughs> the basic of levels. Right, um, so I feel like you just have to be really real with yourself and figure out what am I willing to sacrifice. Janelle was talking about this on Twitter the other day. Growth will take all of you, mm. and I retweeted and I said, "Your new life is going to cost you your old one. Mm. You can't be out here doing the things that you've been doing for the past five years." Thinking all of a sudden you're just gonna glow up tomorrow like Gucci. I mean, it's just not gonna happen. Like you have to take some time to really invest and in, you know get clear about your goals because ultimately it's gonna shape how you spend your time, who you hang around, what you listen to, like everything. Mm, I think y'all also know something too is. Because I know entrepreneurship, the whole thing is really cool now. It's sexy to everybody you see online traveling. It's how you get paid to travel. No. You get paid to that. <laughs> but the thing is, like, because I, I fell into the gamble too. I was like, yo, I'm tired of boss, whatever. I, I did stuff. So I got on my own. And I was like, hold up, what am I really going to do with this time? Like, because when you don't, like, if people don't want to build teams, what are you going to do with a team? You'll have no processes in place. You really don't know how you're going to leverage them. So then you got his team. That's what happened. I had, I remember to this day, three years ago, had like 10 volunteers and we met at, we met at a freaking, um, Blueford Library. I said, yo, I'm a motivational speaker. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. 10 volunteers in a week. I ain't know what to do. And I said, like, what we doing, Mr. Hill? I said, well, shoot, what we, what we doing? Like, shoot, like, all I had was one thing. All I did was speak. So I, ain't nothing came in yet. So I was like, shoot, I don't know. 
So then I, I, all this life I was trying to get this team. And even, even today, if somebody was to come to me, be like, yo, GM. Actually, now nah, I know what I would do with it, but like, oh, here's 100 racks. Okay, what you going to do with that? We got this t-shirt company. And like you said, sometimes that holds us back because, yo, you could be with the, uh, when that 1,000 hustling and, and getting it, but you waiting on a st- VC. VC funded. Do the Easter Ray model. Just do, like, she did her show, and then now she has a show Insecure, but she didn't wait for Insecure. She didn't send, I don't know, I can't, I can't lie. She may have sent 10,000 scripts to HBO and said, put me on. But she created something right there. Yeah. I mean, there's so many free resources, and this doesn't get talked about enough. Like, the only reason we're raising VC funding is because we're building a SaaS platform, and we're going to have to hire a ton of engineers <laughs> and their salaries cost a lot of money. <laughs> so we don't really raise at least $2 yeah. million. Dollars. I really don't know what to do. Right? <laughs> but like, once you start having those conversations, to your point, if someone's ready to write you a check, what do you do with it tomorrow? Mm. Right? So you really have to take time to map out. You need to develop basically a product roadmap for yourself. Um, so what's in this product roadmap are your milestones. right? So what do I want to achieve? And then by what time? Right, so if someone gave you two hundred and fifty thousand dollars tomorrow, we just started August. From August to December, what are you doing with that money? Where is it going? If you're paying for marketing, what type of marketing? You doing? Are you going to show up on college campuses, or are you going to pay for Instagram and Facebook ads? Right. If you're going to hire somebody, what's the scope of their work? What exactly are they going to be producing for you? Right. When you go in those rooms and you start having conversations with investors, that's really all they care about. Right. Because that's going to paint the story to them of ROI and like, where is this money really going and how quickly are you going to be able to get it back? to me? Mm, yeah. 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 Um, I, I got two things and I want to open it up for questions. But the last thing I want to talk about, I want to I want to get your thoughts on how you partner with these major brands. Like, what did it look like? Like an email phone call? Because in the, the day. For a lot of for a lot of people I know, their biggest stumbling block is that that partnership piece, and they only like one partner away from blowing up. But they, but sometimes you don't have the insight, you stay in the low hanging fruit round, and then of course you. Get, so I want to talk about that. But this is something this is new, and I want to talk about because it's really difficult. And this is real. Um, how do y'all go about partnering and working with the opposite sex, like in in a business relationship? Because yo, it gets it gets, and, and I throw it out there because um. It gets weird, like, I'm like in my head. seriously, because it's like, yo, like, it, it's because it's, it's serious. Like, you working, you working, like, so you single, you working with single cash is really blowing off, and it's like, yo, and it's, it has to be, it has to be a level, but everybody's different. Yeah. Some people shoot their shot mentality. I'm like, yo, them brothers, wow. But then, like, <laughs> but it's like, so that is, but nobody ever really talks about that, though. It's a touchy subject. It I is mean, touchy. I think for me personally, I try not to work with people that I find. <laughs> because I know how to, right? Like you're gonna be spending hours and hours with this person. That's a strategy. That's a risk. There's a possibility that stuff is gonna pop off, right? Um, but no, seriously, anyone that I choose to like actively date, you don't touch the business, right? Like I have very clear lines with it. Like I may tell you about what's going on, and I'm open to you helping. But as far as like working side by side with me, like we're just not going to do that at all. Um, I would say flip side, <laughs> just you just have to protect your energy, reclaim your time. That's great. Um, <laughs> I would say for women though, and people definitely should talk about this more. It's just you know it is awkward when you have meetings that are supposed to be meetings oh. turn into. Unsolicited first date. Man, I, <laughs> and you asking me why I'm single, and I'm like, we didn't have to talk on LinkedIn for this. You know what I mean? Like, you could have just found me on the gram, right? Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> all that to say, like, be, I don't want to say, like, have your guard up, because to your point, you have to be willing to share your idea. You never know who's listening and who can actually do something for you, right? Like, I could be an investor right now. I'm not right now. <laughs> you wanted to ask me for some money. I'm sorry. Um, but that's the plan in like five years, right? So if you find me five years from now, I remember you were going to raise a fund. I have an idea. You want to put some money into it? Of course, right? Like, you just have to put boundaries around things. I would say as a woman, don't do any dinner time stuff. No happy hours. Anything after six, honestly, I just, I just avoid 
Like at this point, you're either meeting me for coffee. Actually, the best meetings are breakfast meetings because you get them done and out of the way, right? You don't have to worry about someone sipping drinks or doing whatever and they saying something or maybe you think it's something like you're clear and you know you're in your best frame of mind top of morning um so i would say anytime like you're setting up meetings with investors or a guy and you're really kind of unsure about his motives i would either do a breakfast or a coffee meeting or maybe a lunch but then avoid all the other stuff that's very practical that's yeah, real because it can get messy and to add on to that you could always meet with another person like yeah. you come at another person to Oof. <laughs> You know, that's one way to kind of make sure that doesn't happen. Set me up. Um, another thing to think about is as you're growing, I know this position is usually not, you know, the, the first position you think of, but having someone that can act as, in that HR role, right? Uh, so because a lot of times when you're the founder, you'd be surprised most people won't come to you with their problems, right? So you need to have that third party, that HR that kind of like helps them and so you can find out what's actually going on. And sometimes it may be you, right? Not not in a you know in a position where maybe you're not um, you're not the best at you know getting feedback, right? So having that third party that could really understand both sides is really critical. Um, you know, I, when I was running my clothing business uh, when I was 19, I had 16 employees. 14 of them were all women, and two were male. And I remember I had a during the interview process, I saw like there was a spike in the number of males that would start applying, and I'm like, wait, hold on. <laughs> why, why are they actually applying? And some people all like people have like ulterior motives, right? They knew there were a bunch of women coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, wait, hold on, like, you know, overnight, it literally happened. We put put up a team picture. Oh, you put a team pick up? Oh, 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 they said. <laughs> Just really being thorough in your interview process and um, setting expectations. I think like very clear expectations is really critical as well um, because you know you know the person knows what you're you know what they're being asked of and vice versa. Setting expectations. Now in terms of you know partnerships and uh, partnering and working with like these major brands, whether it's Versace, uh, Urban Outfitters, and so forth, um, or Salesforce tech companies, it's really you know, I think I've gotten really far is because of how people always feel about me, you know, after they met me the first encounter, right? They always talk about that moment. They're like, yeah, when I first met him, he, you know, he was like this and he made me feel good. So you have to give him an opportunity. You have to respond to his email because you need a sponsor. You need someone that's willing to go to bat for you, right? It's hard to just, you know, get the, you know, the highest apple on a tree. You need you know, those people, those apples on the ground level to kind of vibe with you, right? And so then when you really need that favor, make sure you really need it. <laughs> they only have one opportunity at it. You have someone that's willing to go to bat for you. And um, I think once you build relationships like that, when you're, whenever you're seeking that next level, it'll be a lot easier because you'll have people that, you know, you'll have like a crowd of people like cheering you on and kind of being your cheerleader to get that opportunity. On a practical level, can you share? Us, can y'all both share us like a, a story of like when you like? Okay, you say you partner with say Urban Outfitters or yeah. whatever. Like, what did that tangibly look like? The story or the, like the pipeline? Yeah. So when I did Urban Outfitters, um, this was like I had one foot out the door at PwC and one foot in the door. But I'll talk about two. So Urban Outfitters, we had a I don't know how much I can disclose, but anyways, it was a. Uh, <laughs> A million dollar project we had to do in about six weeks, and we had to implement uh, this Salesforce technology. Um, the advantage, though, that we had was that I worked in retail, right? I knew the language, I knew it in and out, I connected with the CIO, the CEO, you know, the people on the team. As uh, the people that were very technical, they didn't really understand why a customer, you know, would want to return something back, right? Um, or receive something in less than two or three days rather than waiting five or seven days. So that was an advantage. Now, in terms of smaller, like, startups that I work alongside and, like, Base Butter being an example, um, the partnership always, you know, has to be beneficial to both people, right? Because you're providing value and they're providing value back. And you also have to set expectations at the top. Right, um, meeting with them and really discussing thoroughly. A lot of times, your excitement will cloud like 
the, the work you have to do. You're like, yeah, I'm so, so excited to get started. And you get started, and you don't really know what you came there to do, right? You're really unsure. You're lost. Um, so setting those really clear expectations and not being afraid to talk about money, right? You can't be afraid to bring that up. I know most people, they, they'll go in a meeting, and they'll try to wait till you know, the very last second, like, oh, yeah, so what about, no. like, how? That's the first thing I'll bring. I'm like, all right, look, like, this is what it's going to cost, right? Um, you have to become comfortable with talking about money, right? Because when you're partnering with someone and you're providing value, that's your time, right? That's the opportunity cost. You could be doing something else. So you have to be comfortable about talking about it. And the one thing that I do is, you know, I have contracts ready, right? I have proposals ready. You got I know my packages. So I know my services that I'm providing. If someone will ask you, well, how much is this charge? You're like, well, let me get that. You should know all those things off the top of your head. And as soon as they say they're interested, you should have a system set up. Once you put their information in, it automates. The email gets sent out to them, right, with a proposal. And as soon as they sign the invoice, a second email gets sent out, hey, let's get started. So really establishing that foundation, right, all the automations, what you offer, what you're really good at, and play off of your bread and butter, what you really do well, and that will get you indoors to be able to do other things. When you market yourself as, well, I could do all of this, right, um, it's hard to resist that. Are you like, well, I can photography? I can, like, just... Just focus on one thing that you do really well that you think can provide them with the most highest value. And then when you're working with them and you're building that relationship, they're, they're going to need some of those things. You're going to be like, yeah, we're looking for a photographer. But, well, I, you know, I do photography. Let me give it a shot. And because you guys already have that relationship, it's a lot easier. Rather than when you come in and you do everything, then they're uncertain. Like, you may sound like you're like, wow, I'm like, you know, I'm really good at all these things, but in their mind, they're like, wow, they do everything. Is that a good thing? <laughs> Is that a bad thing? Yeah. I mean, I would say for me, like, I was blessed because our startup has everything to do with my past life. <laughs> Um, so I've been b- building relationships with these companies for years. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I show up at their doorstep, it's not like, hey, I have a recruiting startup. It's like, I used to be in your shoes, and I know your pain, right? So I always sell to pain first like let me get a clear goal um, I don't sell my first conversation I'm never selling right because a smart salesperson knows that you have to ask questions to figure out if it's even a good opportunity for you right because I could be here and be like I have some brand new shoes I know you want them but what if you just bought shoes yesterday or what if you plan on buying shoes next week or what if you have shoes in like a cart online somewhere right like which is why you really have to get clear about I like to call it my intake call or my intake meeting. Um, So I come prepared with questions just around the company's goals, right? So we're talking about recruiting. How many people do you want to hire? What types of positions are you looking for? Do you work with any vendors right now? If you do, what does that look like, right? Um, So you also start, this is good information for you because you know who people are working with. Um, You'll start to hear common names. Um, So the more common, you're like, okay, this is someone that I need to look out for. And this is someone that I need to research a little bit more. Right, So in the case that all of your answers seem like a good fit for what I'm selling, that's when I go back to them and say, hey, I really enjoyed our first conversation. I just want to follow up with a recap. I'm not a fan of paragraph emails. They really piss me off. Mm -hmm. Um, So all of my client emails have five or less bullet points. um, And then I have a deck for everything at this point. So I have a pitch deck. I have a partnership deck. I have one-off decks based off of the partnership deck. Um, we have event-specific stuff, um, so it really just depends on, on what the partnership actually is. Um, also, to your point about pricing, know your pricing, don't move from it. If someone can't pay it, talk to you later, right? Because, no, seriously, though, because as soon as you're willing to, like, cut down and keep cutting down the price, you're devaluing your service. Um, so something that's kind of hard for us is we're for-profit, but we have a very, like, socially good kind of mission, right? Like, we want to help people find jobs. That don't mean we're going to do this shit for free, right? So a lot of my time, I'm reminding companies, like, hey, like, hiring diverse professionals is not charity. charity. Mm. This is something that's going to impact your bottom line. Mm -hmm. This is something that companies are losing millions of dollars on right now because it costs so much money when you mishire, right? So you find the right person, they quit, or you find the wrong person, they just didn't work out. Right, so we're kind of finding like the sweet sauce to that. Um, I would also say just being persistent, finding opportunities to upsell. 
Um, so I'll use Spotify in this example. I want to shout out to Nasia. She actually has her own events agency, um, but she plans all of our events. Like she's wow. been on tour with us. Okay. And it all happened because we actually met at an event like this. <laughs> so I'm very serious. Um, and yeah, we just kind of hit it off from there and she does everything for us now. Anyway, last year, Spotify, which is one of my favorite clients just because they're so dope. Um, but one of our, we used to do these office tours one off. I remember our first office tour was actually with Spotify in 2014. My point of contact at the time had left and then they just kind of fall off, fell off. And we were also working with Pandora at that point. So I was like, well, I don't really care because we at least have one of the streaming companies. But there was always something like, I would love to get back into that. Um, I ended up meeting our new point of contact. He wanted me to speak at a conference, did that. From there, I built it into selling him into um, the tech crawl that we did. Um, when was this? 2015 now. Um, well, 2016. I remember talking to Denasia, and she was like, you know, we should, what if we just like let them come in for free because they're so dope? And I was like, nah. I was like, they got money. <laughs> I got to ask for it. So I did, and they actually offered me more money than I asked for <laughs> because my contact was so dope, right? From there, we sold them on this HBCU tour that we did earlier on in the year. That was another substantial amount of money, um, and we're actually planning something with them in the fall right now. So this is now our third time partnering with Spotify in nine months, yeah. right? Like, that goes to the power of build that relationship, provide as much value as you possibly can, and continue to upsell as much as you possibly can. I know there's an A&T person in here, so I just want to shout this out for you. The event that we're doing with Spotify in November is actually flying up 120 HBCU students for free to New York. They're going to house them. They're covering everything. It's fabulous. That was the conference that I spoke at last year, which turned into us planning this for them this year. Um, so if you have any friends, sorry, I had to do this plug. No, you, you have friends that are pl in plug away. Right now, <laughs> <laughs> By all means. Please, please, please follow up with me or send them to our website because we have more information. We are the only vendor on this, which means everyone that gets to go goes through us. Um, so if you have someone, especially you, I would love to just get your information if you want to come. Um, but yeah, send them our way because. That's our job. Yeah, we definitely got to talk offline. I'm the plug of plug, so we got it. We can know, put it out. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> definitely. I think the biggest thing, and wanna, I want to open it up for questions, so we because we're about to transition after the questions to the PSA thing, because I know schedules are getting tight. One thing I got out of all y'all, with, with everything y'all said, that everything and everybody is a relationship. I think sometimes we, we group people into, okay, this is a business relationship right here, and this is like personal, this is my homie, or this is like, oh, I'm at a, I'm at a happy hour, I can just do whatever. But now, as you get older, circles are so small. So you throwing shade or just getting too close to somebody, and then you walk up, and they're in the room and for a, a sponsorship meeting. You're like, dang, like, and you close all these doors because you just so, like, if it's not, or right here, we having great conversation, we're building, and then you leave, and it's just you a whole different person, no purpose, no nothing. And then all of a sudden, like, you in these spaces, like, dang, what? And a lot of us, unfortunately, we don't have the net to really be like that. Other, other cultures, they can, they can act whatever and they can go in and still do that. Us, I mean, we, and then plus, honestly, too, like you said, sometimes we don't give us each other an opportunity. So you have a person of color in a, a company, like, oh yeah, I know they're gonna look out. We have a good relationship, whatever. And then that door gets closed. So I do, I do, I do want to ask, uh, Actually, I'm not gonna ask. I want to open it up to the um the audience real quick before we go to PSA. I think I'll do three questions max, and then we gotta just jump right into um having our other special guest talk. But if there's any pressing questions that y'all would like to ask, that can add value to the whole audience, man. I mean, I'm all for it. If go. Oh. In technology, um, all kind of emerging technologies that people are talking about, not talking about, people know and don't know about. Um, what would you say the most important thing that's out in front of us for the next year, three years, artificial intelligence, blockchain, um, that, that relate to what we should know um, while we're creating our business? Because not knowing it, you know, we may be creating a business that's not even going to be around for the future. I mean, I think AR VR is very, very popular. Um, AR VR? Yeah, so augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, there's a few startups, definitely. Pokemon Go. Yeah, uh -huh. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so creating kind of like these real life experiences. 
Oof. I think a lot of like major brands are going to start doing some really innovative things in that area. Like maybe PlayStation will have their own AR VR lab. I don't know. Maybe they're coming up with it right now. Um, so I think that's just going to be hot because of how society is changing. Um, the one thing I will say though is like don't get caught up in the trends because there's still some businesses that make a lot of money that are not sexy businesses, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> right? Or just sexy products like. I forgot, I think we were talking about like, Craigslist and how Craigslist has not changed. Look, it ain't Since they started. Since 99, Do you think they care? No. Because they're doing what they need to do and they're making their money, right? So all that to say, don't get too caught up into the trends, but I would say my top ones, definitely AR, VR. There's a lot going on in the healthcare, health tech space right now. I'm seeing companies that I don't really like their ideas just getting funded because <laughs> they're in that space, so I would look into that. Um, FinTech has been hot yeah. for a while now yeah. um, because yeah. you're also thinking about, like, you don't want to just think about consumers like your friends and your peers. Mm. Like, no. I mean, I don't want to say that. Success looks different for everyone. Yeah. Let me say that first, right? Like having a retail location in Atlanta may be fun and successful for someone where someone else wants to start the nasty gal of tomorrow, yeah. right? So I think you have to get really clear on like what your goals are. What kind of business do you really want to have and how big do you want it to be? But if we're talking globally, right, you're thinking of things like FinTech, health tech, like things that are going to be able to affect a large amount of people, I think that's going to be a really good use of your time if you're looking at trends. Yeah, in terms of tech, I'll keep it short, is um, um, I think that focusing on service, right, a lot of these businesses, what tech is doing is just catering the service, delivering faster, right, like uh, getting food to your door, right, Mm -hmm. it's all about that customer service. And customer acquisition is higher more than ever because there's so many competitors out in the market. Um, say, for example, if you ordered from your one of your favorite brands and they promised you that it'll be there within two to three days, but it gets there within you know 14 days, that may be the last time you're ever going to shop with them. And not only that, but you're going to tell that experience and that story to the next person and the next person and the next person. So service is really big. And the second thing is automation. Right In like five to ten years, most of the jobs that you see now will be gone. So it's like our job to focus on you know, that kind of field and automating uh, processes that you do right now because that's where the gaps are closing, right? Like these people that have investments or the next big company is thinking about automation. How do I make something more streamlined, more simple, right? Like look at Domino's. You could just uh, put the pizza emoji and you could have it delivered to your door. Right, because they pick up where your your location, your IP, and they deliver the pizza. So really focusing on automation, like where next, right? What do people want simpler? How can I solve a problem for someone automated? Yeah, I think Ladron has a question in Miss Bridges, and I do want to note one more thing, just to throw it out there. To really, I think y'all hit on the importance of really knowing yourself, knowing what success looks like for you, knowing what your business looks like for you, because. In my business, I adjust my prices. Not for a lot of people, but I know to do what I do, I can't say I thirty five hundred for this YMCA. Yeah. And I'll be like a prick. I'm from Durham. I'm in Raleigh, and I'll say thirty five hundred. And I, if I don't have nothing to do, so I mean, I knew I got into this speaking game, this whole thing for the culture, so I can adjust. There's certain things I won't adjust anymore as far as corporate or you do that. But if you don't know yourself, then you'll. Cause I know certain people they don't take gigs and they're killing their brand because they don't got no film, they ain't got no reps. You can charge $5,000 a speaking gig, but you ain't getting those $5,000 calls. So where are you getting your reps at? But if you don't know, you say, but it's all because somebody else told them they flew off the thing. No, I'm saying no to everything. It's not my rate. You're not talented enough to be charging that anyways. But I mean, but you don't know. your. See, it's real. Like when I first started, I thought I was like, I heard people say this way they get paid for speaking. I was like, oh, I'm ready for that. I was not ready for that. I didn't have no press kit. I didn't have. All my all my videos look like I was talking like ten kids at some something and how I want to go to a corporate company say seven thousand. Yeah. So, but if you got it, once I knew myself, I knew what I had to make do all that stuff. But that's a whole different conversation, Lejeune. Yeah. Um, what do you think, or actually for both of you, what do you think is the issue with people that are uh, or the stem of the problem as to why there's this lack of diversity in tech? Oh man. How much time do you have? <laughs> Sounds like a three-day conversation. I mean, I think 
at a bare minimum, it's because tech companies and tech investors are pattern matchers by trade. Um, so how companies are funded are typically based off of networks, right? So you think of a very wealthy white guy in Silicon Valley that sees other white guy that may be like his neighbor's nephew or something that went to Stanford. You fund him, his company does well. Let's continue to fund people that look just like him for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why diversity is broken on that side. Um, but the issue is once that company gets funded, right, he's going to hire in the same pattern that the investor chose to fund him in, mm -hmm. right? So if your first 10 hires are all white guys, and then your company is at 50 people, and then it's at 100, and it's like, oh shit, we only hired three black people, what do we do now, right? That's why the industry looks the way it does. So not saying that it won't change, I'm very, you know, I'm confident that, you know, the solution that we're building, there's other, you know, different organizations and companies that are really trying to make a difference. Um, and I know that it's not a pipeline problem, that's just mm -hmm. the bullshit they like to use as to why not to hire people. Um, I think it's really on us to make sure that we're actively getting back and creating a lane for everyone else to come up mm. with us. Because if you think about the pattern matching, that's all it is, right? Like, I'm a white guy. Let me go give another white guy a chance today. Mm. We don't do that enough mm -hmm. as black people, yeah. right? It's like, I'm a black person. I made it. See y'all later. Let's close the door on everybody. <laughs> I did what I was supposed to do, move my mama out the hood, get my friends cool. You know, everybody eating, everybody eating, we living. Meanwhile, it's just like, but what about everyone else, right? And I think going back to like what success looks like, for me personally, everything that I've ever done is purpose driven. So similarly to you, I'm kind of a serial entrepreneur. I came up with my first business plan when I was 15, right? So I've always been having ideas, always like trying to do something. But every business plan I've ever had was in a purpose of helping us, mm -hmm. right? So how do I create a space? How do I create a lane? How do I give access where access didn't exist before? Um, so, you know, we can talk to white men so they're blue in the face about not being racist, sexist pigs, but we've seen how far that's gotten us, right? Like, we have, and I hate to bring up my, my brother's new voice, but, like, we have to bring ourselves up by our own bootstraps in this instance, if we want to see change, um, you know, on a crazy impact. I agree with everything you said. Yeah. <laughs> I approve this message. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Ms. Bridges. You mentioned about a company that you work with, but there are a lot out there. What is your top resource to keep up with the news with all of this? Yeah, so I use, are you meaning uh, just like what's going on? like right. in the landscape. So I filter like my Twitter. Um, I have like Twitter lists. Are you guys familiar with Twitter lists? So it's like different when you're using Twitter as a, you know, as a social, right? Versus using Twitter as like a business, right? right? When you're thinking business, you know all these other extra additional functionalities like Twitter lists. So I'll have a list around, you know, retail companies, tech companies, up and coming tech companies. And so every morning when I wake up, it's about like the routines you establish as well. So every morning, you know, I get up at 5.45 a.m., I'm in a gym, I'm running about three to five miles, and then I do a little bit of reading for about 30 to 45 minutes. So I'm going through it. So instead of waking up and just scrolling through Instagram while in bed, right? And that's what most of us do. We just, you know, grab our phone and just scroll through Instagram. Yeah. I, I do. I got. I got. I got to check the juice. Twitter. I go to these lists that I created, looking at okay, what are companies saying, you know, and then, you know, obviously you always run into Trump because everyone retweets the stuff, <laughs> like the stuff because wow. it's just outrageous. Wow. Um, and then another thing that I do is Google Alerts. So I'll set up my Google yeah. Alerts channel, seeing uh, what are the most recent news that's coming out. Because when I'm talking to these companies, I'm. Literally going, like, I'll see the company, I go on my phone, I look at my Google Alerts, like, oh, these are the last two things that happened, now I have something to talk about. Mm -hmm. right? And they're like, wow, you know a lot about us. I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know a lot about you guys. But, so Google Alerts, Twitter list, and something that I, I do really big, like, I have a, uh, I, like, accountability circle, right? And they're normally other entrepreneurs. And so a lot of times, you know, I heard this one story, like, you know, 
When Oprah sits down to eat her meals, she's always eating with other people that are experts in their fields. So that way she's getting that information right then and there. And so I have people that are different fields, entrepreneurship, and um, I'm able to get that value, extract that value. That's why I always try to have like breakfast with someone, lunch with someone, dinner with someone, because that's another way to get value. Um, and it may not happen all the time because you know they're busy as well. But whenever you have that opportunity to, like, always do that because that's how you extract that information. Mm. I would say all of those. The only things I can think of: Crunchbase. I feel like as a tech entrepreneur, if you're not on Crunchbase, you're kind of missing out on everything. Um, so I do that. Like, if I have a quick client meeting or we're going to see a fund, and I'm like, "What do they do again?" Crunchbase is like my go-to. Um, angel list well angel.co um, and then I, I mean like fast company Inc um, tech crunch um, those are kind of the main ones I feel like I'm missing something product hunt. Mm-hmm. oh yeah product hunt is good yeah. Yeah. I love product hunt app sumo yeah. like there's all like there's yeah. like more like it's, techie yeah. focused ones um, yeah. I would say focus on like two or three or three to four. It's hard to like do everything because you only have a limited amount of time. And one thing that I started doing two years ago was setting, um, I would, you know, out of my, you know, the money I was earning, I would take a certain percentage and say, okay, I'm going to reinvest this back into myself by going to support other people's events and also going to different events, right? So every like month I try to attend one event. Right, where I could get value from or give value. Um, and so that would also allow me to know about what else is going on and what's up and coming. Because a lot of times they aren't in the major papers, right, when you're reading Wall Street or Entrepreneur. Um, the up and coming brands, you have to go out there because other people are talking about them. And life hack, if you see an event that you really want to go to, but it's crazy expensive, just volunteer. Mm. volunteer or mm-hmm. Amen. try to find a way to get involved like in another way. I'm all about bartering services. Don't get it twisted. I love securing the badge, but you know, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do and you know, everyone is at different levels right? So, even to this day, like I went to TechCrunch last year, I didn't pay for it. If I did, I would want a refund because I'm like, who would pay $2,500 for this? It wasn't even that great, right? Um, I mean, just wasn't honestly. Um, so all that to say, like, if you see like you know a tech crunch, a social media week, whatever, there's a thousand of these conferences at this point. Um, you know, just scroll to the bottom, find the contact us. Just be like, hey, I really, really am interested in attending. Can I volunteer? Or do you guys have any like scholarships or you know packages available for people where you provide some kind of financial assistance? You would be surprised. A lot of people are where they are right now because they don't ask. Mm. We just make up in our minds. Like, oh, That's know, a t-shirt. It's too much, or it ain't for me, or it's just not going to work. Just ask. The worst you could hear is no, but then you can hear yes, and that could change your life. Mm, man, wow. <laughs> and then last, last question, then we're going to jump into this uh, PSA thing. Building relations out, relationships outside of your immediate network. Or the, 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 the black community, I should say. That. Okay. Yeah, that's, what I'm mm, that's a good question. <laughs> so you're saying, how do you like, <laughs> no. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and so, I mean, I could talk a lot about this because I grew up in a lot of different pockets and neighborhoods. And I remember, you know, when I started living, or, you know, I went from the all-white school to all-black school, and I remember walking in there and, like, you know, always raising my hand in class to answer the question, because I just thought that's what students did, but <laughs> not black students. And, um, people would always tell me, like, why do you talk so white? Why do you do this and that? And so it's very, it was, like, discouraging. And, um, and a lot of times, too, like, you know, some of my closest friends are, like, white. 
And I would tell my friends this, I would black and I'm like, wait, what are they like? <laughs> and they had a very limited scope. And I think it wasn't until I started to travel outside mm-hmm. of Philadelphia, outside of my bubble, that I started to realize like, wow, like these people are like more similar to me and in terms of like the vision that they want, you know, they also want to take care of their family. They also want to build a brand. We align on so many different things. And so I, I never saw it as a challenge. And I know there are some people that do because some of them are my friends where they're like, well, I don't know, I feel uncomfortable. Maybe they're like using me as the token black person, right? Um, but I think that once you, you have to, tell yourself that like you deserve something, right? Like if someone's willing to help you, like tell yourself you deserve it rather than thinking that they're trying to use you all the time. And you gotta kind of get out of that mentality. Um, so I'd always put myself in the most uncomfortable situation, networking events. I remember last October, I was the keynote speaker, uh, the C- uh, COO of the Ritz Carlton was winning an award and I was the keynote speaker. And here I am walking up to the stage, I look in the crowd, it's just all white folks, right? And they're like old white men. I'm like, it's going to be a tough crowd. Like, what, what am I going to tell them, you know, that they don't already know? And they're probably just like uh, a black guy. Like, you know what I mean? And so, and I, I could have been defeated, right? I could have, you know, uh, but as soon as I got up there, I made a joke about Trump. I made a joke about Obama. They just started rolling. They're like, oh, this black guy is kind of funny, you know? And so, he looks like Chris Rock. He's going to throw out some random black right guy. Right after, right. you know, I got a standing ovation. Like, the video is up on YouTube. And, you know, a bunch of the executives, there's over 600 executives in the room, came up to me like, where do you work? Like, do you want to come here? Do you need a job? Like, let us know. And so always putting yourself in those situations where, you know, like, um, how... How can you get the most value and growth out of this opportunity? Um, and not worrying about what other people are going to say about you. Because, I mean, if you did that, you, you wouldn't have the time or energy to do anything else. Mm. I would say, like, never being intimidated by anyone. So, again, I know most people are really afraid to do cold outreach and send you better, blind emails. On you better send them things, boy. All that stuff. And you better like, send them. Am I coming across as too aggressive? Or, like, I never cared about any of that stuff. Like, I was just like, this is my goal. I'm going to keep going until I hear a yes. And that's just literally how I am about everything, um, especially when it comes to building partnerships. Um, I would say, secondly, like, I spoke to a, a young girl before this started, um, and she asked me, she had an interview coming up, and she was like, should I wear my hair out? Like, she had her hair braided. And I just wanted to bring this up. I don't change myself for no damn body. Who you see sitting on this stage right now is who I am in every meeting. My friends can vouch for it. I don't care who's on the phone. It could be the COO, CEO, VP of strategy, CIO. I don't care. Right? Like, I just am who I am. And I own it. And, you know, you have to be able to own what makes you different because that's your power. Mm-hmm. Especially when we're talking about, like, the diversity in tech conversation. Who's more qualified than me to have that conversation? You should want to talk to me. You know what I mean? And, like, you have to have that presence about you um, because, ultimately, that's who people want to build partnerships with, people Mm -hmm. that are confident, right? Like, everyone has that friend that, like, pulls girls or whatever, and it's just like, I don't know how he does it. It's the confidence, right? Like, that confidence Mm -hmm. surpasses everything else, right? Like, you have to be able to just have that savvy and that charisma of, like, I know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm a validated source. Like, you should want to work with me, right? And I feel like I bring that vibe to everything that I'm doing. Um, so ultimately, people just feel more confident and like, okay, she knows what she's talking about. Um, so let me make sure that I work with her. But also to that point, don't try to, you know, fit into a box. That's why I, nev- I always knew I would never work in finance. I could never do, like, one of these kind of cookie-cutter things because that's just not me. I'm not going to wear a suit every day. I'm not going to be whitewashed for your white privilege. Like, that just doesn't work for me. It's probably why I work for myself, to be honest. (laughs) Um, But, you know, all that to say, like, you know, just be you. And if a partnership doesn't work out, it wasn't supposed to. And you'll always realize it, like, six months, a year from now. I remember there was one company I really wanted to work with. They went under... There's another company, lost all their funding. It's just like, well, that's why that didn't work out. So I think just have faith as you go along in your process and know 
ultimately any relationships that are forged that are meant for you will happen for you regardless. Yep, yep. And um I'm about to switch to the PSA and the last thing on that is I love what y'all said. You deserve it. You have that mentality like you deserve it. Not I mean not of course if you didn't put in the work, whatever, but in context, <laughs> in context, I don't want to go, I don't want to go on an hour long. That's our, that's, that's two hour long speech. But in general, if you hear, if you navigated it here, you, you deserve what you, to be at that table. You deserve to have that conversation. And sometimes we, we get, especially as black people, we get in rooms where it don't look like us or even the black people do look like us. They look, they look a little bit more deeper than us. Like that's a, then you're like, hold up. But you deserve to be in that, deserve to be at that table. Um, so yo. Let's clap it up for him, okay, man. This is all right. like the value and the preciseness and the authenticity of it, but more so the practicality of what y'all provided today was like astounding. Um, I really say that. Uh, and each stop has their own flavor. Each stop has their own things they they're great at. But this conversation and the directness from both of y'all, okay, to the point, and also with the story too. Like it was just very. Very, I, I loved it. So, New yeah, New York. Yeah, it's very New York. Like everybody was, the, it's just the tempo. I had to do too much. Like I'd be on podcasts with people. I'm like, dang, I had to carry, put it on my back. Like 50 minutes. I'm doing an hour 30 on my back. Like yo, like what? And it's some podcasts. I just like, I'm just like Homer Simpson. I'm in the back, just like observing. Like this is so dope. Like this is crazy. Um, <laughs> Yo, I hope y'all had a blast, man. I know they dropped gym after gym. We had a good time, man. So make sure y'all do a check out the live event. Support the brand. Support the product. We don't put no sponsor on the show because of you. I don't want to be having no Hello Fresh, no no Blue Apron. I ain't selling you nothing. But my own products. <laughs> but uh, once again, once again, thank you for tuning in to another episode of My No Troubles Podcast. We had 183 views. It don't make no dang sense. A couple hundred thousand downloads. We had 183 views. Let's go get the 200 views by next week. Make sure you go to, you can go on my website and see how to do it on YouTube. It ain't that complicated. So if you have the iPhone, make sure you leave a review. If you don't have an iPhone, share it with a friend, tell another friend, and thank y'all so, so much for your time. So as I always do it, as I always do it, as I always do it, I need you to do two things and two things only. And I know what you're asking. What is that, Mr. Hill? One, like I said before, leave a review, and two, change the freaking culture. Good night.